okay? Does it work? Good. Uh, so thanks yet again for coming for the last lecture. And um, as I told you today, I'd like to go to sort of state of the art um, results related to early universe physics. Um, and specifically, I'd like to take our very basic, uh, but I think first principle tool set that we've built up in these lectures and try to understand one relatively recent result, which has to do with a certain generic class of models um, for the dark matter of the universe. Okay, so what we will discuss, if I have time, I will uh, discuss yet another uh, relatively recent result about properties of dark matter. Okay, but we'll see if I get now. So the main point I'd like to discuss here are uh, constraints, or well, first the possibility that dark matter is in fact composed not of slowly moving massive point-like particles, be it black holes or wimps, but instead dark matter is being composed of an ultralight scalar or bosonic field, so ultralight, scalar fields okay and <clears throat> so I uh, to my understanding Javier has uh, started to discuss axions and axion like particles so this should make contact with uh, with the general topic and as, as you've heard from him it is possible that a neutral light scalar field um, could play the role of the dark matter in the universe because, as we will see, um, it has the correct equation of state, cosmological equation of state, if its mass is in, a, is in a certain ballpark. And what we would like to do here is to understand, we will try to understand recent limits or recently derived observational constraints on the mass of such very light scalar field playing the role of dark matter. And these limits say that there is a lower bound, a strong, relatively model independence or robust lower bound to the mass that such scalar field could have if it is to play the role of dark matter. And this limit is in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 21 to say 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. Okay, so this is indeed an ultralight scalar field compared to, so if it, if it saturates this limit more or less, it would be an ultralight scalar field really. It is most likely not anything, has an, nothing to do with, for instance, um, the PQ axon on the, uh, the axon postulated to solve the strong CP problem of the standard model, but still, Nothing stops us in principle as particle physicists to uh, hypothesize the presence of, of such ultralight scalar field and particles like this with this kind of mass spectrum could arise for instance in string theory as some light moduli fields. Okay, so a particle like this could exist and this lower limit to the mass is robust. Okay, so we have orders and orders of magnitude of if you want to call it parameter space but I'll call it ignorance about what the mass of such ultralight scalar field should be for it to provide the dark matter. And it's very good for us to have a robust lower limit. So at least this parameter space in some sense is not infinite. Okay, so I would like to understand this limit. And the observations or the data um, is driven by so mostly these limits, the recent limits, are derived from observations of the Lyman Alpha forest data that I'll discuss a bit, and also from the CMB. Now, we are not going to build and apply the full theoretical machinery needed and observational machinery needed to interpret and analyze this data. Instead, we're gonna derive this bound just from very, a very simple argument, and it will be a crude argument, so we will be able to reproduce this bound to roughly an order of magnitude, give or take a factor of 10, okay? But still, you can understand this without knowing 
almost anything besides the bare essentials about the physics of, um, of, these, of these data sets, okay? So that's my goal, derive this limit with the tools that we have so far. <coughs> so here is a snapshot of the relevant data. What I have here is Planck measurements of the CMB um, two-point correlation functions. So what is happening, this Planck satellite goes out to space and it looks in two directions at the same time and it measures the flux of photons coming in from two directions on the four pi sphere of the sky. And it takes the difference and this difference gives us a perturbation, so a delta in, in flux or in temperature, flux, energy flux of the photons is proportional to energy density. Energy density, so flux of photons that Planck, that is the energy per unit time that's hitting the, the antennas of Planck's is proportional to the energy density of the photons, which is pi squared over 15 times the temperature of the photon to the four, which means that the differential flux over F is basically four times delta T over T, okay? So, and what we're thinking here, we're looking at some direction N on the sky, okay? This is some angle on the four pi sky, and we can define this way a temperature field, fluctuation temperature field delta T as a function on the angle on the sky, okay? And this is, there is just a factor of four conversion, okay? So this is what Planck is doing. <clears throat> and now Planck is, um, is looking at different directions on the sky and it's scanning different directions. And what Planck is doing is taking effectively the correlation function of this fluctuating field as a function of N and the same field looking at another direction. And this can be decomposed in YLMs on the sky, okay? So each of these fluctuating field can be decomposed in YLMs as a sum on L and a sum of N times some coefficient ALM <coughs> as a function of the angles on the sky, okay? So, so far I've done nothing, just decomposed um, this, uh, this field on the sky. And then the famous CLs, so DLs are here are proportional to the CL coefficients, the famous CL coefficient and the CL coefficients um, are given by expanding this field in Legendre polynomials. So this correlation function would be a sum on L of the famous CL coefficient times 2L plus 1 over 4 pi with some Legendre polynomial of n dot m. So we can extract the CL by averaging um, the correlation function over small distances, so small separation, small angles n dot m. We have large samples on the sky with these containing many segments with this small separation. We can average over it and get the coefficient of a given Legendre polynomial, okay? So these are the spectra that Planck is measuring. And now I could do the same sorts of decomposition. I could do it for the temperature fluctuation field. And I could also do it for the polarization, degree of linear polarization of the CMB photons. And the two-point correlation function of the polarization would be this EE, which has the same structure, but just with the degree of linear polarization. I can also take a um, cross correlation function. You can see autocorrelation functions are positive, okay? Positive definite, cross correlation functions can go negative. All of them contain a huge amount of information. The red lines are lambda CDM predictions with the best fit Planck derived parameters, lambda CDM parameters, and the blue are actual data. And each blue point is an average over many multiple moments that Planck can see. So you can see this multiple moment L, this label of the Legendre polynomial, <coughs> goes to the thousands, okay? So we have many, many modes. And each point here is the average of many months. Okay, so this is an example of this um, precision data um, that these analysis are based on. I'll make another comment about the, the CMB data, okay? So 
The comment is that this data is theoretically usable to understand early universe physics. It's almost directly usable when we go up to L of order 1,000, maybe 1,500. As we go to even higher L, what actually dominates the power spectrum on L significantly larger than 1,000 are foregrounds emission or obstruction of the photons coming from the CMB. So it's not really primordial information. It's cosmological information, all right, but it's not really what we want to care about. So the useful, if you want, so, and, and to get rid of this, you see that Planck gives you this theoretical curve going all the way to 2000. They could go even a little bit more. But to do this, you have to understand that auxiliary free parameters that are the theoretical parameterization of these foreground contributions to the measurement, they are being marginalized over without solid, as of now, it's an active field of research, but we don't have very strong, if you want, theoretical understanding of, of these sources here, okay? Over here, these foreground sources are not important. The correlation functions are dominated by primordial CMB fluctuations, so this is directly useful. Here, and I was asked in one of the previous lectures to warn you, I think, when something like this happens, here we, we, are, we are sensitive to theoretical modeling. There are three parameters that you don't see. So we will really consider the CMB as, um, with Planck data at least, as a strong probe of early universe physics, all the way up to L of order 1500 or 2000. And Planck data and other experiments that can go to even higher L right now have to deal with foregrounds, okay? So L goes to, to a few thousands, and we have a very decent agreement between theory and measurements, okay? at the percent level in the bulk of this region, okay? So we can derive strong constraints on the origin of these perturbations. And to make the connection to a particle physics scale, what I want to do first is to explain why angular scale is just a nickname for physical scale. And in fact, physical scale of something on the sky, okay, in the early universe, is interchangeable with time. For each distance, there is a characteristic time. And this time is going to be, we are going to be able to relate it to this bound here, okay? So, CMB data, is robust, I'd call it robust agreement with theory of early universe physics, I would say, up to L of order 10 to the three. I'm not gonna care about factors of two or three here, okay? Now L, is interchangeable with the scale lambda. And let me, for all of my scales in this talk, I'm going to use commoving scales. Okay, you already know what commoving scales are. Commoving scales are um, the size of an object projected to today, as it would be today modding expansion out. Why is that? <clears throat> well, what is this multiple L? What Planck is doing, we have this sphere on the sky And we sit here in the middle, and we look at photons coming to us, okay? And structure on this uh, four pi sky would correspond to some typical um, size of L in these correlation functions. Here's a notable one, which is the sound horizon net recombination. And the mapping is as follows. So imagine that you have some, um, typical scale perturbation lambda, okay? So I'm looking at an essentially homogeneous, almost homogeneous sky with small perturbations on the surface of last scattering, okay? So this is, of course, the last scattering surface of the CMB. And imagine that I have a, a, some uh, perturbations of scale lambda, which is, you know, this blob of inhomogeneous blob in the density of the photons, okay? It's a tiny, it has a tiny amplitude, 10 to the minus five, and this is what Planck is seeing. And let me work with the commoving size of this perturbation. 
Now, the angular size, the angle that this perturbation will subsend, okay, the photons are coming to us from this perturbation, and they subsend some angle uh, theta, and you can get this angle theta just if you know the distance to the last scattering surface. So let us call the commoving distance to the last scattering surface theta naught, okay? And so the angle is related to the size of this perturbation in homogeneity lambda, typical size, once you know the distance to the last scattering surface. And to relate to L is very easy because L basically counts how many times L is the number of, is 2L is the number of nodes that a perturbation has on the 2 pi circle, essentially. How many times you can fit this lambda in the 2 pi circle? So L is roughly 2 pi eta naught over lambda. Okay, so the distance to here is eta naught. And I can fit this perturbation lambda over eta naught times on the 2 pi eta naught circle, yes? Okay, so this is the number of times that I can fit this lambda on this scale. And so it's essentially to represent this with a Legendre polynomial, I would need of order L nodes, give or take a factor of two. Okay, so there is a relation between L and the, the scale of this lambda. Now, um, as you've already seen in, in many plots, in many um, plots already in this uh, course, lambda is, uh, it is convenient to interchange lambda for a scale by saying that this commoving scale is two pi over k. Let's define this k as follows. So all I'm doing, I'm saying I have this field on the sky in real space, okay? And it's convenient to Fourier transform this field and work in Fourier space where linear scale lambda corresponds to some wave number k in units of one over megaparsec in this case, okay? And the reason that this k is so convenient in all of these analysis, the reason, essential reason is because this perturbation delta t are very small, okay? So to remind you, the perturbations we're talking about, this perturbation delta t, which are proportional to um, uh, density perturbations in the photons, okay, of order 10 to the minus five, is much, much smaller than one. As a result of that, when you Fourier transform this field, so imagine now this field as a field in real space, okay, well this is the homogeneous average. It's a very small perturbation. When I Fourier transform these perturbations, different K modes in my Fourier transform do not interfere at linear order. And the evolution equations of these perturbations <coughs> separate, they decouple for different L modes at first order in perturbation theory. So this is what it's called cosmological perturbation theory. And the idea is that all the deltas, I can have several deltas in my problems, um, delta like this, so I can have delta t that I wrote before, so I defined it as, um, well, usually one puts the, um, the index down here, and delta t will be the total temperature over density, so this will be the relative temperature over density, okay? And for instance, I can write delta rho, which I'll define as, say, the matter over density over the average matter density. So these are dimensionless fields, and they are all in the ballpark of 10 to the minus five, or maybe 10 to the minus three when it comes to the dominantly dark matter perturbation. So these are small fields, okay? And cosmological perturbation theory is basically the theory of the time evolution of these delta fields. And now it's convenient, all of these different delta fields, yes? And now it's convenient to decompose them and work already in, in Fourier space. So these delta fields in Fourier space are a function of wave number k and of time. And the theory that is so successfully describing these CMB fluctuations is the theory of the time evolutions of these small fields. And the reason that we can really do it so well um, 
is because these fields are small and a linear perturbation theory, the equation, the evolution equations that are coupled between these different deltas, but are a linear set of differential equations, as long as we express these perturbations in terms of k. So each k mode evolves separately at linear order, and linear order is good because the perturbations are very small. Okay, so this is the theory essentially that's working so well here. And this is also why this k is so useful. And this k says that for each L, okay, I can match a k, a wave number k, which is the wave number attached to lambda. So this L is k at a knot. And let me call it L sub k. Okay, so an L on the sky, an L of this correlation function corresponds to a physical scale on the sky here, I present it in commoving coordinates, and this corresponds to a commoving wave number k on the sky. That is going to come up shortly. Let's put numbers. Okay. So let us put some numbers here. So what is the, the commoving scale to which a given value of L corresponds? Okay, it will be very important for us shortly. So for this, we have to calculate the distance to the last scattering surface, but we have the tools to do it. So at a knot is the distance from us to the same the last scattering surface. So you can write it as C times a time integral, you already know how to do it, over A of T from T recombination until today which is C times the redshift integral from zero to Z recombination, dZ over Hubble of Z. Okay, and if you put the numbers, this is an integral you already know how to do, so this you can write as C over Hubble naught times integral dZ and the usual square root, yes? So nothing stops you from plugging in the numbers that I gave you earlier and getting to the answer. And the answer is that this at a knot is about 14 gigaparsec. So the commoving distance of the last scattering surface, the this distance from us today, is about 14 gigaparsec. Okay. So now we can put the numbers here. Okay. And what we find <clears throat> is a relation between LK and K, just plugging in the numbers, and the relation is that K is essentially L over eta naught. It's measured in one over megaparsec, commoving, okay? And it's about 0.1 megaparsec inverse L over 1,000. Okay, so large L corresponds to large K. What the CMB teaches us, it teaches us about perturbations of typical wave numbers. Since the most useful data from the CMB is at L of order 1,000, that's where we have the most statistics and still very strong theoretical control, okay, without strong foreground effects, then this is the most important part of the data for us. And this data is teaching us about perturbations of characteristic wave number 0.1 inverse megaparsec, or physical scale, phys physical commove or commoving scale of 2 pi over this. Okay, good. So L is size, and this is the relation. <clears throat> the second thing I need, um, is to point out, okay, so now that we've reduced CMB information to information of what happens at some characteristic lambda or wave number k, I would like to attach a, diff a time label to this k. And there is a special time label attached to each wave number k. And that time label, oops, so k means a special time. Let's call it tk. 
And this is the time of horizon entry. Okay. What does it mean, horizon entry? Um, so Javier already showed you a plot where this effect was manifest. Let me draw this plot. Okay. So what was in the plot that you saw in that lecture was the time evolution, or equivalently, the redshift evolution of the set of cosmological perturbations delta, at eh, lambda, sorry. Yes? <coughs> And as a function of time, the perturbations behaved as follows. Okay, so I'm warning you a little bit that outside of this, at times earlier than the horizon entry, what I'm plotting here is gauge dependent. It's coordinate basis dependent, but that would not be crucial for us. We're going to bypass it. Okay? So it will not be crucial. So the fields did as follow. Consider, for example, that I look at the dark matter over density perturbation. Okay? that I've defined before, delta rho over rho, and it was constant as a function of redshift, and then at some point, the perturbation of dark matter began to grow, and it grew slowly, it grew logarithmically, and then later on, it was shooting up linearly with redshift, okay? So that was delta, let's call it delta C, which is um, the over density in dark matter divided by the mean density in dark matter, and it's a function of time, and it's a small field. So even when this thing is growing, its amplitude is still small at early enough times. This time was the redshift of matter radiation equality of order 3.4 times 10 to the 3, okay? And this time was the time that I care about. The mode, this mode became dynamical. It realized that it's alive and began to have dynamics, at this time, which is the Z horizon entry, I'll call it Z of K. And the plot that you saw, actually, I don't know if you noticed or not, this is the plot of the dynamics of the perturbation delta C as a function of K for some specific K. Okay, there was a number attached, a little label on the plot, I can go back to the lecture. And the label was important because different perturbations would have horizon entry at different times, as I will show. So this was the dark matter perturbation. And on the same plot, you saw, for instance, um, the baryon density perturbation. It started in sync with the dark matter perturbation. This is the meaning of uh, adiabatic perturbations from the CMB. They are all starting in sync with the prescribed relation. Then it started to grow. On horizon entry, it also had dynamics, but then it was driven to oscillations, okay? And the matter perturbations only really began to grow after Z recombination, let's call it Z rec, which is about 1,000. So a little after that, the baryonic matter perturbation began to grow, so this would be delta B. It's the same thing, but the density of protons, okay? And there was also another perturbation there in the plot, which was the photons that started together with everybody and then oscillated with the baryons, but as opposed to the baryons, the photons never revive from these oscillations, okay? And of course, what we see in the CMB is a snapshot of this photon density field at the time of recombination. So this was the plot that was there, and the idea is that to understand this scale, okay? So for a given k, there is a specific time. What is happening at this time? Okay, so consider these perturbations. Imagine that you have this homogeneous, almost homogeneous distribution of matter, and there is some perturbation, some blob of, say, over density of typical scale lambda inside of this large uniform uh, universe, okay? So now imagine a photon starting its way somewhere inside of this blob, at a generic point inside of this blob, and the photon is starting, the photon or graviton is starting its way in this random point in the blob at the beginning of time, okay, at t equals zero. So at t equals zero, this photon is heading out, and it's moving across the, this perturbation. Okay, so this photon is moving across the perturbation. Let's let it move parallel to my arrow. Okay, now the photon takes some time 
to cross the size of the perturbation. And as long as typical photons or gravitons propagating in this fluid don't explore the area outside of the perturbation, okay, then if you want the particles in these protons and matter, dark matter particles inside of these perturbations, they don't know that they live in an over density. Okay, so I have some blob, right, where everything varies on some scale lambda. And if a photon emitted at the very big bang, the region of time, did not have time to explore the outside world, where the density is different, then the particles here don't know that they represent some over density or under density. No dynamics will happen until photons have time to talk between gradients in, in densities, okay? So until, until information connects between um, perturbation and external world, there can be no particle physics implication to what's going on beyond, of course, from chemistry. Chemistry could affect what's going on, but no dynamics, no bulk dynamics, so no particle physics effect. effects because there are no gradients. We're probing no gradients between these things. No forces can act, no dynamics. Okay. Now the time at which a photon emitted somewhere in a generic point in the perturbation, the time where this photon reaches the edge of the perturbation is the time of horizon entry. This is the time that the perturbation realizes, hey, I'm in over density, I gotta grow, I gotta shrink, I gotta do something, okay? Until then, there can be no dynamics. And you can calculate this time, and it's most convenient to calculate this time in what is in slightly different units. So it's most convenient to describe this TK in terms of what is known conformal, as conformal time, which is, just as we had for the commoving coordinates, it's a useful tool to discuss the causal structure of an FRW universe, okay? And it's called conformal time because the interval in terms of this conformal time um, interval is C squared dt squared minus A squared for the FOW universe. The eta squared, this is what I called the, the commoving coordinates before. It was eta with a vector. And this I can write as A squared of t times C squared, D eta squared, minus D eta vector squared. Okay, so I apologize for the slight confusion, but it's very easy to understand what's going on. My conformal time here, so is just what I call D eta. And it's of course not an accident that my D eta is the same as the modulus of eta for an algeodesic. Okay, so just be careful when you read, when you look at the first lecture or second lecture that I gave, I'm gonna use eta for moving time or conformal time. Okay, so my d eta is A of t dt. And the reason that it measures propagation of information, the maximal, um, the causal structure of the, of the dynamics is that an algeodesic in the FRW, usual FRW coordinate system where t is the time measured by a clock sitting on one of these galaxies, okay? So something that moves on null geodesic in these coordinates also moves on a null geodesic in these coordinates in an obvious relation, okay? So the interval just has to vanish for photons. And so my moving time is a useful measure to look at propagation of information. And now we can calculate this time. Okay, so yes. You are totally right. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to use these coordinates interchangeably, basically because I'm talking about null geodesic and the maximal speed that information can propagate. 
And what I want is I want my photon to start at the beginning of the universe and cover a moving distance lambda. And the time it will take it to cover it is the time label that I will attach to this scale lambda. Okay? So this you can compute now. So this is integral from z to infinity, okay, the beginning of universe, to the redshift that I care about. Let's call it redshift lambda. Dz over Hubble of z times c. Okay? So now if you give me the Hubble rate, I can give you, I can attach a redshift to every scale. And when you work out this exercise, you find the relation that I write in here. Okay, so this you know. Okay. Gigaparsec and the relation that I want, I write it in here. And the relation is, um, that the redshift for a given K mode over 10 to the 5, I'm normalizing it to redshifts that are going to be of interest to us. Is about 4.6 megaparsec times K. And all I'm doing Yes, so k is measured in inverse megaparsec. It's the wave number of the perturbation. Just related to lambda in the usual way. And I'm performing this integral. And I'm performing this integral. So since I'm talking about redshift of 10 to the 5, I'm doing this integral at radiation domination. OK, so I'm doing this in radiation domination. OK, times k, which I can write zk over 10 to the 5 is roughly 0.5 times k over 0.1 megaparsec inverse. OK? So k has a special time. This time is the time that it takes information to propagate across an inhomogeneity of typical size 2 pi over k from the Big Bang. Okay, so that's the time label, and it's convenient to express this time label in terms of redshift. Okay, and here it is. Now we have almost all we need, given that uh, Javier already derived for you what a scale, what an ultralight scalar field like this actually does cosmologically. I'll just repeat this derivation very quickly, and then see what it means. Let me erase this part. Oops. Let's summarize what we had over here. There's a pi in here. That is
Okay. We actually have everything we want, almost. Okay. So what does the light scalar field, what does we mean by when we, when we think about light scalar field as dark matter? So what we have in mind here is that the universe is filled with, um, with the condensate of ultralight scalar field, phi, that has some potential energy density, V of phi, and satisfies a Klein-Gordon equation, okay? An equation of motion, the equation of motion in an FRW background for this field can have only time derivatives, okay? Because every spatial guidance has to go to zero in the isotropic frame, and that's the equation of motion. Okay? And actually, what I will care about, I will just care about the case where the potential energy density is that of a free massive scalar field with a very tiny mass. So I'll take the potential energy to be half m squared phi squared, and our calculations will be correct if interactions, terms like lambda phi to the four, for instance, or with some beta phi squared, etc. If terms like, so this will be a mass, actually. So, right. So interactions terms are assumed to be small. Now, if the mass of this field is so tiny as is going to be relevant for us, then it seems to be sensible guess to neglect interaction terms, okay? But I'm not going to commit to that. All that I will say is that our analysis is valid as long as these extra terms are not a large um, disturbance to the physics. Okay, so I will ignore this. Neglect. So the equation of motion is this. What does this field do? I think you were, giving, you were given the solution already, and so I'll just give it to you again. So there are two regimes, two interesting regimes for us in the solution, the file that solves these equations, okay? Um, so let's make a plot of that. So first, let's look at what is varying in time in the equation itself. So the equation of itself has some constant mass m, it has a time-varying field that we want to solve, and it has a time-varying Hubble constant. And we want to care about this in the radiation-dominated epoch. So in the radiation-dominated epoch, I can plot the evolution of Planck, of, of the Hubble rate, oops, rate as a function of redshift. And the Hubble rate is just going to go like this, proportional to z squared, and I'm assuming radiation domination. Okay. And now the other parameter of the equation is constant, that is m, okay? So something special is going to happen when this Hubble field crosses m, the value of m, okay? So at very early times, this damping term, friction term, the Hubble constant, will be much, much larger than m, and then you can check and convince yourself that in fact, at very early time when this is huge compared to m, the solution of this phi actually goes to a constant. So if I had, I can write this equation as an equation for phi dot, ignoring any potential. Potential is tiny compared to the very fast expansion. So you can immediately see that the solution for phi dot is going to decay exponentially in this time, okay? That's with constant Hubble rate. When the constant is a function of time, then phi dot redshift is a power law. Of, of the scale factor. But if I started with some velocity, if I started with a phi, that is doing something non-trivial at very early time, that is moving, that has a phi dot, this phi dot is going to decay quickly because of the age, and phi is just going to get stuck. Okay, so throughout this time, our field phi is essentially constant in time, all right? 
And now I'm scrolling time forward. We're going to lower redshift. And at some redshift, because the Hubble scale is dropping, it is going to cross the scale M. And when the Hubble scale drops fast, far enough below the scale M, then the driving force in this equation is the M squared, as opposed to the Hubble friction term. So if you just delete the Hubble term, then the solution in this region, if you just delete, if you set Hubble to zero, then the naive solution of this equation is obvious. The solution would be phi that looks like some initial phi naught times cosine mt. Okay. So that would be the solution if you could delete the Hubble term. You can't really delete the Hubble term, okay? In other words, it's very easy to put back the Hubble term in this limit. So when the Hubble term is small compared to phi, the actual solution is, so with finite, with finite Hubble but smaller than m, the actual solution you find has the same rapidly oscillating form, but with an envelope that scale like one over z to the three halves. I leave it to you to play with this equation, plug this equation in here, and so that this solution works to leading orders when you expand correction. So if you plug the solution in this equation, that's, there is an equality, yeah? So if you plug this solution into the equation, it will solve it up to corrections of order um, Hubble over n, okay? So we're dropping this correction, we have an approximate solution, which becomes better and better the smaller Hubble is compared to M. So far down here, we know that this field phi is doing. So let's say that this is the zero of this field, okay? So far down here, this field is doing little oscillation like that around zero as I define the solution, as I normalize the solution. And the envelope of these oscillations, this envelope is going like z to the three halves. It's decaying like z to the three halves. And the period of the oscillations is m in f of w time, okay? Good, so this is what this field is doing. Now you can write, for this scalar field, you can also write the energy density rho and the pressure phi for this field, okay? Just derive it from the energy momentum tensor written for this phi. And the energy density for this phi is half m squared phi squared. More precisely, the energy density is V of phi, okay? Plus kinetic term. And the pressure density turns out to be So the easiest way to write it, it is minus rho phi times cosine 2mt, okay? So if you plug in this energy density, if you plug this um, in this energy density, the solution for phi, when phi is doing something interesting, when phi is uh, oscillating over here, then when the Hubble rate is smaller than m, then rho of phi is a constant because this is a cosine squared, almost a constant, yes? This is a cosine squared, this is a sine squared up to derivatives proportional to derivatives of Hubble rate, okay? So sine squared and cosine squared gives me just one with an overall of m. So what this gives me is a half m squared phi naught squared, and it's enough for me to square this, um, this envelope, so I have a one plus z cubed for the energy density, and my pressure continues to do what it did before. So pressure of phi, we, we just found the solution, is minus rho as before, cosine two mt. Okay, so what we have, I can write the energy density, rho of phi as a function of redshift, okay? So here rho of phi would be just a constant, 
okay, because the kinetic term would be zero. And here, the energy density is just going to reflect what the envelope is doing. So the energy density is going to decay like z cubed. And this is what dark matter does. The energy density of dark matter, of a collection of slow massive particles, decays with redshift as z cubed, okay? What does the pressure do? The pressure just reflect this in this region. The pressure just reflect um, this decrease of the envelope, but the pressure always keeps the oscillations because the pressure oscillates with period empty, with, with, uh, with period one over m, yes? So the pressure exhibits a similar scaling, but it oscillates very fast. That is very much not what the pressure of massive dark, dark matter particles do because they just have negligible pressure by assumption throughout the evolution. So this field, while its energy density works like dark matter, its pressure is completely different. Okay, it's oscillating with time. The reason that this can work as dark matter is because you can calculate what is really the time attached to this frequency m, yes? So the frequency of these oscillations would go like m, okay? So that's 10 to the minus, say, 21 electron volts, okay? And to write this in terms of times, I just need one famous identity that I wrote before at some point, which is that h bar is one, and it's also two times 10 to the minus 14 GV centimeters. And if I divide it by C, then it's roughly 10 to the minus 24 GV times second, okay? And a GV is 10 to the nine electron volt, so I have 10 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds. Correct me if you find a mistake. Okay, just multiply by 10 to the nine. So my one electron volt, I have here 10 to the minus 20, one over 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So what I have here is 10 to the minus six sec hertz, yes, good. And one year is three times 10 to the seven seconds, okay? So these oscillations are of the order of a tenth of a year or of the order of month. Okay, so the time scale of the oscillation, this cosine two mt, these are oscillations on a time scale of a month. Now a time scale of a month is tiny when compared to universe time scales when structural formation is happening. Okay, there we're talking about thousands of years, 500,000 of years at the time of the CMB, okay? For example. So it's a very, very short time scale. This pressure is oscillating on very short time scale compared to the cosmological scale when structural formation is happening. And so it would average out, okay? And what I've said is just equivalent, of course, to the statement, the universe time scale is just one over the Hubble rate. That's what it is, the dynamical time scale of universe expansion. And all I've said is that in this domain, pressure oscillations that are, that are affecting, that are produced by the scalar field are happening by construction on time scale that is tiny compared to expansion time. And so they average out effectively. Okay. So the pressure, the effective pressure, so let's write it as P of phi in absolute value, okay? The effective pressure would be stuck together with the temperature in absolute value, and then it's just going to go to zero. So to be more precise, I write a time average and this is still the actual row of phi. So if you make a time average on times of order, the dynamical time of the universe, this, because of the fast oscillation, the effective pressure just decays exponentially. And so in this region, the fluid has an effective zero pressure and an energy density that decays like energy density of massive particle dark matter should decay. This is why it behaves as you need it to behave 
to make dark matter? It's a non-trivial question. You should work it out for yourselves. That uh, what I described here is the behavior of the, of the background, the uniform cosmological background of this field. But it's true that once you have an equation of state with pressure equal to zero and density doing this, structure formation will also work correctly. Okay? So it's a natural question to ask. If the background behaves correctly, do perturbations in the background behave as we expect? And on cosmological scale, the answer would be yes. So, good. Here I have dark matter. And here I have something else, not dark matter, from this phi. And what I have here, if you work it out, you just find that in this region, rho of phi is a constant, as we said. And in fact, this p of phi is minus rho of phi. And so what we really have here is a cosmological constant. Meaning, because this phi is just stuck in some point, our Lagrangian density contains a contribution just equal to v of phi at the point where phi is stuck. So this in time is a constant. Okay, so really this is just a cosmological constant. Very good. So this field has a time. As opposed to ordinary particle, massive particle dark matter, so when you, talk, when you think about a 100 GeV wimp, for instance, as you know, this 100 GeV wimps tends to freeze out if in, in some mundane thermal history for wimps, tends to freeze out at a temperature of about one part in 10 of its mass, roughly speaking. Okay, so for 100 GeV wimp, this temperature corresponds to time long before BBN, redshifts much larger than 10 to the 10, okay? And later than that, dark matter wimps have no time scale attached to them. They just decay like Z cube. They do nothing very interesting. But this field has a particle time scale. It has this transition time scale. Before the transition time scale, the universe has no dark matter contribution from this field. It has a small cosmological contribution from this cosmological constant contribution. Later than this time scale, the universe has these oscillations, so it has a contribution to dark matter from this field. So no dark matter here, dark matter here. So that's a funky behavior. And we can use it to constrain the field. Let's start by constraining it using our CMB data and see what we get. Okay, let me, I can kill this. And we really don't need much in the way of details to get a CMB constraint. All that we need to do is to remember that robust and accurate measurements of the CMB on scale and on multiple moments L of order 1,000, they map to scales K, wave number, co-moving wave number, of over 0.1 inverse megaparsecu moving. And this maps to a redshift of order 10 to the 5. And what it really means is that this density perturbation that is imprinted here in the CMB, it has a history to it. Yeah, so if this is Z recombination, Z equality, so of course redshift goes this way, and zk with our relation, then this density perturbation, what we're getting it is a snapshot of these baryon acoustic oscillations. For our delta rho gamma, okay? So delta rho gamma is oscillating sense horizon entry. And while it's not growing, it does have dynamics, and it has a phase, in particular the phase at which we catch the perturbation when we take the snapshot at zero combination. So at this point, the infor information is going to us, yes? We cannot see what is going up in here because Thomson optical depth is huge. We just see a snapshot of the status of this perturbation at zero combination. And this snapshot is sensitive to the phase in which these oscillations enter the perturbations, okay? 
And this means that since we can measure and constrain these perturbations so well, we better not mess up their early childhood, okay? So the early childhood of this perturbation, the early growth or development, evolution of this perturbation, the phase in which it will arrive here will depend on what this perturbation does right around the time of ZK. Okay, so if I have no dark matter, for instance, at around this time, something is going to happen. Okay, so I'm going to mess up the phase of this perturbation. It will enter, it will hit the snapshot of Stimbilla scattering surface with slightly different phase. We're not going to quantify by how much this is the case. I'm just telling you that these are measurements valid to a percent accuracy. And if you mess up at order one, the early childhood of this thing, you're going to be sensitive to it at the time you take the picture in class when this thing graduates, okay? In other words, for these perturbations, they are L of a thousand or a K of 0.1 inverse megaparsec, and so the redshift of 10 to the five and so if the universe has no dark matter at redshift of 10 to the five, the early childhood is messed up, okay? So CMB says, roughly speaking, that we better have, we need, dark matter by redshift of order 10 to the five. Okay, now the smaller L perturbations, of course, also need dark matter, but the mapping is such that the smaller L perturbations correspond to smaller K, and so the constraint they impose is on a lower Z. So if you want a perturbation somewhere in here, for it to look the way it looks, it, there must be dark matter by the time of redshift of order 10 to the four, okay? But what we really, our constraint will be driven by the highest L or the earliest time, or the highest redshift, okay? So if we need dark matter by z of order 10 to the five, this means that it better be that the Hubble rate, when the redshift is 10 to the five, is smaller than the mass of our little scalar field dark matter. Otherwise, there is no dark matter then. There is just a small contribution to cosmological constant. And now we can just work this out, okay? So working this out is very simple. You already know how to do it. Um, so I'll just give you some answers. So the conformal time as a function of redshift is roughly, I think I said it, 4.6 megaparsec moving times redshift of 10 to the five. inverse, and this is just an integral from z to infinity, the z over Hubble of z, okay? Now, in radiation domination, and this is definitely radiation domination, in radiation domination, the Hubble rate is proportional to temperature squared, so it's proportional to z squared. So integral dz over z is integral dz over z squared, which is just one over z, okay? So this eta, in other words, I can write this eta of z is equal to z over Hubble of z. So in other words, it's a convenient expression that this Hubble expansion rate is a function of z. comes out to be, so Z over Hubble is about our 4.6 megaparsec Z over 10 to the five to the minus one, which says that I can write this Hubble rate as 1.5, 10 to the minus 23 electron volts z over 10 to the six squared 
and I've saved you the exercise of converting h bar to one again. And I'm just writing frequency one over time in terms of energy, convenient energy. And what we learn from this <clears throat> is that there is a constraint on m because the CMB tells us that by zero of 10 to the five, there should better be dark matter. So it tells us that 1.5 times 10 to the minus 23 times 0.1 squared, m must be larger than this. So m must be larger than of order 10 to the minus 25 EV, yes, m of all, over an electron volt. So this is lessons from the CMB. Okay, so we've derived a robust bound. Of course, it's an order of magnitude estimate. We didn't actually do any CMB analysis. All we did, we imposed that the early childhood of these modes is not affected um, by this transition of the scalar field from being cosmological constant to being dark matter. This constraint is still much worse than this. It's a robust constraint from CMB, but where this constraint comes from is actually from a different data set. Okay, so first, other questions up to here? What we did, yes? So, so, so can you explain uh, precisely why it is that we need uh, dark matter at that point? Yes, qualitatively, yes. I will not derive it precisely. So the point is related to the physics of the evolutions of these density perturbations, okay? So if you want to understand the dynamics of this delta rho of gamma, the dynamics of this delta rho is coupled with the rest of the perturbations. So this cosmological perturbation theory has a set of fluids. So let's define delta rho gamma. We can have delta rho B, delta rho for dark matter. We'll have the gravitational potentials, okay? So you can think about this. So in the gauge that I plotted before, this will have a slightly different parameterization, but this you should think about Poisson gravitational parameter, essentially. It's the perturbation touched the gravitational pot uh, potential. There will be other perturbations. For instance, there is a perturbation in the number density of free electrons that I can have. And these perturbations obey a coupled set of linear differential equations. They are coupled between the perturbations, but they are not coupled between different K modes. Okay? They are coupled because as dark matter is collapsing into gravitational wells, it affects the gravitational potential. This gravitational potential attracts the baryons and the photons in it and basically initiates these perturbations. When these perturbations collapse begins for the baryons and photons, they begin to fall in the gravitational potential wells. But then the pressure of the photons pushes them out, okay, and they're coupled to the baryons strongly. So electrons and photons just do these oscillations. Protons have no choice but to follow the photons because Coulomb interactions are very strong. Okay, so all the, dark matter, all the standard model plasma undergoes these oscillations, but the initial period, the initial evolution is governed, you know, the phase of this thing is governed by everybody beginning to fall into the dark matter potential wells, okay? There is a dark matter over density, it introduces a potential perturbations, and everything is beginning to fall into it. So the initial phase, if you mess up the time evolution of the dark matter over density at this point, you're going to shift slightly the phase of these oscillations. And how much you shift them, this is something I didn't quantify here. It would require a little more time, um, but it is not so difficult to calculate. And so it, it will basically cause a small distortion in what's going on in these power spectrum measurements, okay? So all I said, I wanted to strictly impose, I wanted an order of magnitude estimate, and I wanted that there should be dark matter in here so that there is a dark matter perturbation to speak about, and it participates in this coupled evolution equations. Now, if there is no dark matter here, and it only enters in here, meaning that the Hubble rate at zk is still larger than the mass of the particle, then you're going to have some change of phase here, and again, some non-trivial dynamics when you enter this oscillation phase, which will, again, stretch this mode a little bit. Okay. So we just impose that all this transition, the dynamics of the scalar transition, happening well in advance. It's an order of magnitude estimate, but it gives you an idea for the power of CMB to constrain this. But now it's also, we also learn something clear here. Okay, so the bound that we have is M larger than the Hubble rate at some redshift. Okay. 
and the Hubble rate goes quadratically with redshift, which means that if we have an observable that is sensitive to higher redshift, okay, then we will get a stronger limit on M. So CMB qualitatively was um, roughly was sensitive to redshifts of order 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, okay? And so it gave us this bound, 10 to the minus 25-ish electron volts, give or take factor of 10. But what we need is an observable that's sensitive to even larger Z. Larger Z means that we need an observable that probes scales with a higher K wave number. Or in terms of lambda, the actual size of the system that we want to look at, this should be smaller. It should be a smaller scale effect. And this kind of observable sensitive to higher wave number on smaller scale physics is what the Lyman alpha analysis gives us. Okay, so now we connect to the Lyman alpha, but the physics is all in here. Okay. <clears throat> so, what we, all, all we really need from this Lyman alpha forest data is to know what is the kind of wave numbers, commoving wave numbers to, to which it is sensitive. But I want to say a few words about what this data really is without too much details. I think I have a slide. Yes. So we met this slide before. And what is the data that we're talking about? Um, well, we're talking about um, observers measuring this continuum emission light, okay, a continuum spectrum of light coming from this hugely bright light bulb, sometimes in the early universe, a quasar, that's sending this continuum light at redshifts of order a few. Okay, so the time where this light bulb is turned on and from the time from which this information is coming for us is redshift of a few. So first thing that you should realize is that the observable itself, as opposed to the CMB, the CMB was literally measuring the physics at the surface of last scattering, redshift of a thousand. We are looking directly in the eye of these perturbations. Here something goes in the way. Our early perturbations, and now let me plot a dark matter perturbation. As a function of redshift, this was, let's call it um, delta rho c. This was zk, and this was z quality. Okay, so z quality was of order three, ten to the three, yes. And the CMB was oscillating happily here, and the CMB map took a snapshot of the picture, literally of the CMB perturbation here at redshift of 1,000. What's happening to us here is very different. When are we actually taking the snapshot of these perturbations? Our observable exists far, far to the right at redshift of order four, you know, three to five, I would say. Okay, so these perturbations are doing what they're doing, and far in here somewhere, we are sampling these perturbations by looking at some physics related to these quasars. So everything going up in here is redshift lower than four or five. Okay, so we are sampling the field in here. Nevertheless, the constraint we will derive, again, is related to the very early childhood of these perturbations. Okay? What is it that we are really measuring? So this Lyman alpha forest data, it looks at absorption features in the continuum emission. Okay, so here the red line is a model for the continuum spectrum of light from the quasar. And here it coincides with the black curve, which is the, the actual measurement. And here, under the model, there are absorption lines from the Lyman alpha transition that I plotted here. Now, these absorption lines are occurring because there are clouds of gas intervening in the way of this light coming from the quasar to us. The statistics or the clustering in redshift and in angle on the sky between different quasars of these absorption features correspond to the statistics of these intervening gas clouds. So they are a measure of the clustering of matter. 
It's not a trivial measure, but on scales of a few tens of megaparsec, a redshift of order a few, these intervening gas clouds are still in the mildly linear regime. So the perturbations are still not huge, they're order one. They're not like in the galaxy here, which is the perturbation is 10 to the six, yes? These perturbations are order one. We can roughly use linear perturbation theory with corrections, okay? So what we're measuring is the distribution of these intervening gas clouds on scales of a few megaparsec. And so if you, you have a field here in a slice of time, you have a field of density perturbations of these gas clouds in real space. As usual, it's convenient to separate it to Fourier modes K. So I can write some matter perturbation as a function of Fourier mode K. And then I can calculate the statistics of this matter perturbation with different K numbers. And this is proportional to some power spectrum times a delta function. Okay. And this power spectrum, as long as linear theory holds, we can compute it from first principle. It basically reflects this power spectrum is a function also of time. So I should write time here. In principle, I can correlate different times and different wave functions. Okay, so it's a power spectrum. It's also a function of time. And what these measurements are doing, they're probing this power spectrum at universe time of about z to the 4, which is sampling the perturbations around here. And again, we can compute it as a function of the initial conditions. Now again, so this calculation is roughly linear all the way to, to gas clouds of the order of a few megaparsec, maybe 10 megaparsec at redshift of four. It goes nonlinear <coughs> quite abruptly <coughs> when you cross <coughs> to gas clouds of order a megaparsec co-moving, okay? So 10 megaparsec, linear control, essentially, roughly. Megaparsec, really relying on simulations, nonlinear gravitational collapse simulations and baryonic physics to some extent. So in, what I'm trying to say is that like in the CMB, we were limited. We couldn't really exploit L of 10,000 that we could get from some ground-based experiment today because foreground was dominating this emission. Non-linear baryonic physics galaxies were dominating the CMB anisotropies or the photon anisotropies at these high multiples. Essentially, the same thing happens to this Lyman alpha forest data. When you look at very, very large K, in this power spectrum, you begin to be dominated by nonlinear and baryonic, nonlinear gravity and baryonic physics. Okay, so just like we had a maximum L we could trust, we have a maximum K we can trust here. And what exactly is the value of K that you can trust this Lyman alpha forest data? This is slightly controversial, I would say, but the calculations and the measurements, the calculations are marginally linear, and the measurements agree with observations all the way to K of order, I would say, order one co-moving megaparsec inverse, okay? So in other words, we have a probe here of the clustering of matter or these density functions all the way to scales about a factor of 10 smaller, co-moving scales, factor of 10 to 100 even, smaller than what we could access with CMB. This is what makes this constraint the strongest that we currently have. It's still marginally linear. It's under control calcul in terms of the computation, and it probes very small scale. So we are allowed to go from this to redshift of order 10 to the 6 or so. And if I go back to my constraint, just using this relation and imposing that in the birth of these perturbations that we measure with Lyman alpha forest today, there was no, there was dark matter, I get a constraint that this M has to be larger than the Hubble rate at Z of order 10 to the 6, which would make, get me to about 10 to the minus 23 electron volt from the equation I wrote before. And if you push this data to some extent, as the authors of the very recent limit has, has, has done, so if you really rely on the nonlinear simulations, then you can actually go to even smaller scale by a factor of a few. And this limit, I would say, go to all the way down to minus 
21 to 10 to the minus 22 electron volt. But what this limit is that you get from the papers is exactly, is essentially that, yes? Not to mess up this early childhood, let me give you a reference for a very recent analysis that have done these simulations, these mildly nonlinear simulation already, that allows them to go to scales of really a few inverse megaparsicle moving. And so the recent reference is this very nice paper. And now you can understand essentially what they're doing without going into all the machinery. Okay. So I think with this example, I'm essentially done. Um, multiple is scale, scale is time. The time where particle physics can be important is the time of horizon entry of a mode, important for the dynamics of a mode. You can understand a bunch of limits or searches for dark matter properties from that. It could have been, in principle, the dark matter actually has a mass smaller than this limit. And then you have here an observational probe. Okay? It could have been that we would see it. It's very interesting that people have gone out and looked for it. I think it would be very interesting for all of us to think about alternative methods, also to probe earlier and earlier times. In particular, improving the robustness of this mildly nonlinear gravitational collapse and baryonic physics simulations could tighten this bound. It's a constraint on gravity, the gravitational effect of dark matter, but in this case, it's directly related to the particle physics, just to the mass of this particle. So we have some power just understanding the basics of what's going on. Um, so with this, I'd like to finish. Thank you very much. <laughs>